Um, welcome and thanks for joining the W3C community group call for Open Active. So, um, it's the usual domestics, the mics on mute, please, if you're not speaking, just to limit the background noise. And we are recording the session, so if that's no good, please leave now. And yeah, just a quick reminder if you haven't already, please join the, um, the W3C group. Uh, it takes a few clicks, but it is important and ensures everyone agrees to work in the open and ensures that you're on the mailing list, which simplifies keeping everyone informed. And today we're going to focus on the data quality um, in Open Active, picking up from the work we we spoke about a few weeks ago with, we had the data quality hub from Office of National Statistics join this call uh, and explain a little about data quality action plans. So I'll give you a quick update on the work we've done so far behind the scenes on that. And then we want to focus on a particular use case today about discovery. We want to we're following a data quality, quality action plan process. We're gonna explore some of the critical data fields, uh, ensure that what we have in the specification is sufficient for to meet that discovery use case. Um, and then explore data quality metrics around those critical data fields. So um, explore how we can report on data quality over time to help us identify any actions or identify what needs to be done to kind of improve data quality over time with a view to hit, hitting that use case, to delivering on that use case. Um, and then I'll explore some next steps beyond this call. So data quality action plans, um, we heard from ONS, and we're, the approach we're going to take, data quality framework for Open Active, is based on that action plan approach. Basically, action plan approach, the way to describe it, is around focusing on the purpose of the data uh, and why you've collected and why you're, you're hoping to, to, to work with it, um, rather than just looking at the data you've got, and you know, which is really tempting. And, and I, I almost did exactly that, just dive in and look, start looking at classic data quality dimensions, completeness and consistency and all those kind of things. Um, but take a step back from that, think about the, the purpose of the data. What are you trying to achieve? Um, ask those questions and what do you need to achieve those purposes? And what can you say about those things? Uh, so that's the approach we're going to take. So um, repeatable measurements, data quality metrics tied to the purpose so we can identify actions to kind of tackle the root cause of any problems, improve the data set over time. Does that make sense, everyone? Quick review. And so they also talked about this idea that you can get a selection of metrics from the data um, and then measuring them over time. You, you, you do the rag status, red, amber, green. You can imagine that, and then you can look at each different use case. So we have the uh, discovery use case, which we're focusing on today. And you might find that, yeah, you, you've got great quality data for that. And this is to move away from just saying that data is good or bad in such general terms, you focus it related to each use case. So maybe we've got some areas to work on in the booking. And when we look at some new uh, use cases like social prescribing or, or whatever it might be, um, we find that there, um, you know, there might, the data might not work in those circumstances. So it's a useful tool for exploring the wider uses of open active as well. Uh, so that's just summarizing, I think, what we're going to achieve today, or hopefully we're going to make a start on that. That's okay. So we can start from scratch. Um, and you just start with that, that in order to meet the discovery use case, we need to, et cetera, et cetera, and work through an exercise like that. But we, we, there's already so much work been done on this and we have, um, we have an existing data model. So we could just dive in and look at the, the data model and the spec we've got. So this is um, an exercise that Chris has been through already. And if I put this link in the chat, you should be able to um, open that up and see for yourself in a little bit more detail. But Chris, do you just want to explain what we're looking at here? Of course. Um, so, um, if it's in the chat or not, yeah, that's fine. No, it's not. Essentially, what I've done, so on the previous slide, um, Howard showed that you have the data model that's from the modeling opportunity spec. And so what I've done, if you just go back a slide, sorry for a second. Oh, sorry, yeah. 
So this slide here, so if you, um, I don't know if you're able to zoom in a little bit, just so we can, uh, oh, no. if you go to the, the box in the middle, event. Yeah, I don't think I have any moving capabilities. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> okay, no worries. But anyway, the, the box in the middle is events. So in there, in that model, it's giving you all of the, obviously the fields that um, we want to see um, in the data when it when it's going to get a transferred across. Now, it doesn't break down though on there what's required, what's recommended, what's optional. So if you go back to the next slide, sorry, Howard. So what I've done is just on this slide here and in the in the pack, um, or there's the spreadsheet that's in the chat now. I've just taken those boxes and I've just then highlighted. So the green ones will be your what's required, the orange is what's recommended, and then the sort of blue purple is what is optional. And then from that, it's then a case of then deciding amongst the community, are these the right ones? Are these the ones that should be required? Are these the ones that should be recommended? And are these the ones that should be optional? Should we be thinking about, um, you know, rearranging the importance of what ones are going to come through in order to meet both the use cases but then making sure that as we follow it all through, that the data quality is uh, where it should be at every sort of stage of the uh, data life cycle. So there's just a, you know, a start of a 10, just sort of a bit of a mapping exercise, just to highlight what uh, elements are there, what's required, what's recommended, what's optional. Um, and like I said, if you've got the link open, you can see how I've mapped it all the way across um, for each of those boxes that you saw in the previous data model. There's some that haven't got colors highlighted. That just means that there isn't, anything further down in the spec so within the spec as it goes through obviously it explains in a bit more detail and it has a, examples doesn't it and then you have a box that then shows you what is required what's recommended what's optional so if you for argument's sake organization image and address hasn't got a color because it's then not highlighted later on in the table from what i can see but then you have um, a little bit further down where i've got not in the model but on the table there's telephone same as an identifier uh, are in the uh the table saying these are recommended but not highlighted at the top of the data model so do we want to have that consistency in the spec that everything is all in that one place do we want to just have something that has all of the required ones so we can focus on the critical data elements um and you know so that's really the conversation there for us yeah no that's great thanks chris i think um when i've expanded the uh the spreadsheet out i see it does it does go right along and um so I think just for now, we've got, if people have got the link to the spreadsheet, um, can anyone confirm, is it opening for people outside the ODI? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's okay. All right. So, I mean, it's a Google Sheet, so you've got, you can, um, I think you can add a comment. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so if, if there's anything, as we're chatting along, if you want to add a comment, that would be, that'd be fine. But I think we'll just scan through some of these green items is, a, is an easy route in. These are things we've identified as essential. And we're just sense checking that we're meeting that uh, use case for the discovery. So this is someone in an activity finder or um, uh, you know, using, using the tools to be able to discover what's happening local to them. Um, and, and you know, bear in mind, we want that to be a positive experience uh, to get them help them find an activity that's suitable to them to get active. So um, starting at the start, I guess, with the, with the events. And uh, to, to your mind, to my mind, I think we need to know what is the what is the event, what is the activity, where is it, what is it going to cost, those kind of questions. So I'm just trying to see if those, those are the things that stand out. Um, Um, URL. So, so someone uh, who's been around a bit longer can give me help me out here. Is that maybe Nick? Is is that um, a link to a, an indiv individual identifier URI for that uh, event, or is that like a public facing? Yes. Yeah. That yes, that's right. Uh, that's a, a public facing. Sorry, the URL is the public facing um, page that user can access. can find out about that event so that that is a human readable version of yeah exactly that url is consistently used across all the all the objects to say this is where you can find more information about the thing so if you're a user um finding that event on say the parasport website they click on that url on the parasport website and they would land on the page of the original 
organization that's published that data. It doesn't have to necessarily be a URL related to the booking system. It could just be the website of the, of the dance yeah. club or whatever it is. So the uh, name, common sense, yeah. Um, description optional. And I've got the thoughts. Does that uh, are the names usually sufficient to give people? Uh, uh, Ollie, you got any thoughts from a activity point of view? Uh, well, description is recommended. Um, I mean, yeah, on open sessions, we push really hard for people to write descriptions, but um, I guess it's quite subjective on what's considered a good quality description. Yeah. It, it might be worth saying that the intention behind the required status in the spec is the is the minimum needed for the data to be useful in the in the basic sense from a kind of system perspective. So, for example. If you don't have location in the postcode, you can't put it on a map. Um, if you don't have a, you can't put it on a list of times that it starts. Um, if you don't have a name, then you can't describe it. And if you don't have a URL, then uh, it's like you can't you can't send it anyone onwards from that point. You can't have, if you have an activity, you can't show it in a search because you don't know how to categorize it. Um, if you have an offer, you can't. There's no price, so you can't sort by price or anything like that. So it's it, they're very functional um, things um, rather than the kind of descriptive things um, based on the idea that those things are kind of core to an experience, like the most basic experience that you might you might decide to build um, using the, the stuff. So it's not a, um, th that's why there's a kind of separation between the validator that validates what's required from a kind of, you, you know, what the system what any any integrating system would expect to be there, you know, and, and can rely on as a minimum. And what from a data quality perspective, we want to say is something that we'd like to see. And you know, various use cases have different, you know, um requirements for level of other fields that it might include. So kind of just separating that idea of like this, what we've got here is the system basic required, like bare minimum set, as opposed to you know what a particular like parasport for example would ask organizations that are integrating to obviously provide relevant accessibility information that's not required um but for the parasport use case it would be so when they're asking people to open up data um they would be saying can you can you please do this and um and we previously have uh, there's been some work started in the community previously to um kind of come up with those what are the fields for the different use cases it's kind of ended up in a spreadsheet that's loosely used now with new integrations to say this is the spreadsheet that um someone on the call will be familiar with these are the these are the fields that um generally are being useful um in in places but that's not that's very different from formal required that's helpful no that is helpful um but we, i think maybe my um the use case i've, I've highlighted that the discovery is just too broad you know and we, we need to think of so I think one of the one of the things Sport England's keen to see is that we make it, or it's perceived that it's hard for the small publishers to get started. And I think so. This idea of sense checking the minimum that's required from a, from that perspective for a small publishers' activities to be discoverable, that could be um, one thing to focus on. And I wonder, is there such a difference between uh, the system requirements? And the kind of most basic minimum user experience, um, you know, that a, that a small business publisher might want to provide. Um, may I, I don't think there's necessarily a huge, a huge difference. Is it? It's the Where is it? What is it? Who, who can go? What, what what it will cost, etc. Um, but of course, you mentioned the um, the kind of accessibility requirements uh, for the disability sports. Um, and that is something it's definitely in focus um in the coming in the coming months probably next year by now of course we will um we will be exploring that further but this is this is more about honing in on that on that core minimum viable data asset that's going to allow that discovery so 
Um, I mean, just so, sorry, back a step on that, Howard. You're, when you, you say that the driving force point in this is there's a perception that the data is too difficult to publish for small providers. So is that something like, you know, a small provider using, for example, open sessions, there's too many fields being asked of them? Is that, is that what that's well, about? I, I think it would be really good to get to the bottom of I think that's the the sense that I had that um, you know that in our in, in you know open data institutes kind of approach to this work the set you know which which was a, a phase of work set out before I joined the ODI so you know I'm picking picking that up um, was that to test that uh, perception that the spec is is not overly onerous, you know, and that so you know to provide reassurance to small data publishers, these are the minimum fields you need. That is, is how I've interpreted it. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't point you, Nick, to any research or evidence for that. That is just my reading of the the way the, the proposals put together. Um and look at this. Nothing stands out in the green sections as being um, overly onerous. Howard, can I just make can I just make a comment? I'm just struggling with this a little bit because I'm trying to work out if the items are green at the minimum, what, what value they actually deliver um, to anybody who's going to be consuming those. Because I'm um, looking at the list in column A. I know that our solution, um, flow, open OpenFlow delivers just about nearly all of those, if I'm, if I'm over rightly. And we still have requirements from um, our um, clients who want more um, to make the solu their solutions work. So I'm just trying to work out how we would anybody would ever get away with just meeting the minimum requirements in green and I expect to have a solution that third parties could consume and publish and have any value from it. But maybe I'm missing the mark. I don't know. Well, no, that's I, I think that was. The, oh, oh, sorry, I was going to say that. That Stephen is absolutely what I was trying. You, you've expressed it better than I did in terms of the system required versus what's actually needed. That that's right. This this is a list of the, the basic system requirements, not what clients are looking for. And also, isn't that what drives it? What clients are looking for. So then. You know, and the others, I'm asking, I've started with the question, are the, are the green ones sufficient or, you know, are the green ones complete? Do we have everything we need? But, you know, the other, the other side is, is certainly true. What else should be there? Uh, and things that we've got as optional. If we want to provide a positive uh, experience based on that minimum viable product, should, should we... Is it enough to say description, for example, is um, is optional or recommended? The orange is recommended, isn't it? Or is it is enough to say that start date and time are uh, are just recommended? So maybe I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, I'm not being very clear here, but the, because these are system level requirements, the use cases themselves will will need a different will need more, as Stephen's saying. So clients will need more depending on what client. Is asking for depending on what use cases they're interested in right they'll be asking for more stuff so there is a there is a a, a thing that's that, that would be really helpful which is to define what particular use cases need so that implementers can decide which use cases they're aiming to um to meet in respect to those but the the so that but that's a slightly different conversation to what's on the screen and what's on the screen is the system minimum and so i would be um I would suggest we probably don't want to add any more required fields to what's on the screen without like a like system based reason. And the reason for that is that at the moment, if anyone builds something that hasn't got a green thing in, you know, then it will fail like the validation completely. So you can't like it's not, you know, it'll fail test suite or fail stuff. Um, and that's that's designed so that it's, you know, that this is the without this, you can't even get off the starting blocks, nothing will work kind of level of thing but as Stephen's saying clients obviously want a richer experience and that's a different thing so and it's and it's 
if we say something's required at a user experience level, we probably shouldn't be failing everything in the kind of way that we fail things that are this basic, if you sort of mean, because that's a different type of problem. It's about making sure that um, if people don't have descriptions that they can be added or maybe, but what we, we want to really avoid, which is what happens if we put too much required stuff in at this level, is people start faking data just to pass the validator. You know, they add fields and they put hard coded values in just to make sure that it gets through, even though, and they put a to-do, come back to you later. You know, we don't have a description right now. We're going to hard code yeah. it in so that, okay. it, you know, you see what I mean? I do, I and I understand clearer. I understand that. And I think, but that that does actually, you know, that is helping us come towards the, the answer that we're looking for today, which is, um, which of these fields do we, maybe, maybe the colors are now a distraction then, but you know, which of these fields do we think are required? Um, no, which of these fields should we monitor over time and comment on, you know? So if, uh, if a description adds to the experience and we can come up with some kind of commonsensical measure of what is a good description, um, then these are things we can report over time. As you say, without driving those perverse behaviors of just putting something in to, to hit completeness. Um, Howard, can I, can I just add something? That, okay. Yeah. Just to say, yeah, so totally agree with what Nick was saying. For example, in open sessions, a lot of these are required um, from, from, our, from our side, but looking at them more specifically, and Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, but not having the end date as required. That leads to partial schedules, I think. And when Gact have been looking at partial schedules, I think Bookwen particularly had partial schedules in the past, which has been causing us um, some issues from an end user's perspective, because we don't know when it, it could be in 2040 that it stops. There's no end date on it. So we can't verify that data. So if we are making any changes, I think the end date is actually a required field um, for the data, if that's one thing that we could look at. Uh, yeah, so we could we could certainly talk to that. So the um, the end date is um, is required for certain subsets of data. Um, we'd have to look at the detail. So event event as displayed on 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 the slide is event is the most generic abstraction of an event of a thing, whereas a schedule um, a scheduled session is the kind of more detailed thing, more duration. Um, so we've had comments from organisations such as tr um, British Triathlon, I think along the lines of uh, events that don't have a clear end date and you know forcing people to come up with durations for things where that doesn't necessarily make sense um, and that's what's driven that for the most generic version but I think the thing to be, that'd be interesting to look at I'm just having, gonna quickly dive into the dev docs and confirm it is what's required for the specific types for a course for a session etc um, because that's probably more Ollie what you're um, you're referring to there and scheduled sessions is a slightly different sorry um partial schedules is a slightly different problem um definitely worth a discussion but i think might be different to this in terms of data quality um that's more about um there is the capability within the spec to provide a schedule that's not 100 percent accurate for systems where um they don't have the capability to provide accurate schedules um and that's that's to allow more systems to participate in the ecosystem um and that definitely is problematic because, you know, with a, without a clear schedule, how on earth do you tell the customer what's happening? Um, but that's that's where some systems are uh, in their kind of development. So, um, but that's maybe a separate thing to pick up. I don't know if we wanted to park that or, you know, we'll put that as an agenda item for another time. So it's a really good conversation. I will, I will make another look. Um, Okay. Um the versus a kind of user experience moments or, or that use case discovery. Um 
And so on that, if we just head back. Um, the thing that stand out. Um, I want to move on from, from events. Um, so again, on schedule. I'm trying to get my head on the, uh, um, we've got a start date for the event and a start date for the schedule. So is that um, start date for event? We'll say starts in July 2020. It ends at some point in the future. Maybe it doesn't have a, an end date. Whereas the schedule is it's on a Wednesday at 2 p.m. or All right, all right. I'll move on from that. So, organization simply the organization is it just, sorry, is it just is it just me? Is Howard dropping in and out, or is that my side? I'm, I'm getting the same experience, people are dropping in and out, it's not that clear. Um, I think Howard, you're you're something's going on because we're only hearing a sentence every few seconds and then it's going quiet again. So we didn't hear all of what you were saying just yeah, there. Right. Give me a second. Well, I mean, while it goes off, just to find a microphone. Um, I suppose just in terms, obviously, of, of the spreadsheet that I pulled together, Nick, obviously, I completely understand um, the point there. And I think I, I think I had the educated guess that these would be more minimum system requirements. I wasn't making the suggestion that we start making more requirements on here because obviously your end that would mean you know putting more through obviously the validator and then just getting like you said we don't want i don't know fake data coming through or whatever just to you know pass the testing phase but it's more I suppose the start of a 10 to say look here's a list of um you know fields are this what we're looking for are this is this on the right lines should this be required should this be recommended should this be optional should everything be required you know is there or is there items on here that are potentially missing to then have a um, a full set of fields that then we could measure in terms then of data quality going forward um in terms of you know the you know your, your completeness and your timeliness etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's the sort of the reason behind putting the you know having this as a starter taking it from the uh, from the spec I, I suppose on the back of that chris sorry this is andy from gladstone i Hi, suppose um, nick um it's, it's probably more of a case of how did yourselves get to the point of what was deemed as required versus potentially what's optional in the in the opportunity feed then that driven through into what's then being consumed if we can get a sort of gauge of that to maybe how that came about and as chris is saying you know maybe there is a time that we maybe need to um, maybe refresh what's that but obviously that, will, that that may have a consequence on the validation models and that sort of thing as well but you've obviously gone through an exercise to get where we are right now um maybe i don't know i, I might be wrong but maybe that's a, a point to look at so you know what we've got in the moment, what in theory, as Stephen's indicated through the development string, there is a set requirement through the validation, what we have to pass through at the moment, which may differ to what we're seeing on here, but then that might be down to the need of the type of clients we're working with versus maybe at the other end of the scale or the mineral data. And it's trying to find that happy path. But I think from what you're saying, Nick, is that for the validation, there is a set criteria of what needs to be passed through at this moment in time. And is there any flex on that? That's right. So the validator right now will fail if anything in green here is not present. As you can see, the, the, there's, there's, met, there's only a few things that are green on the list. Um, and uh, this is this is. I mean, we can probably you can go back and watch the videos because they're probably still online. Uh, we're talking about twenty. I don't know, it was seventeen, eighteen, or something. Um, and there was a there was a consultation um, through all these fields um, and the decision around which ones were the core, as I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, is driven by what's the bare minimum that's necessary to drive a search experience over this data that's meaningful. Um, and, and I know that sounds like it might be a bit subjective. So 
to give you an example, without a start date, you can't search for something that's happening at a particular time. And you also can't tell someone you know, when it might be happening, when they actually want to turn up. Without a location, it's not that useful to someone to know where it is, even at like a basic level. Without an organizer, it's not possible to know who's actually putting on the session. Um, without an activity, you can't search for across a number of different data sources, a particular thing like yoga. And, um, and the activity one, Sport England, were quite keen to push. Um, and I think they were right in doing so at the very beginning. Um, but that's something that, that the, the initiative takes um, quite seriously as they saw the disparate data sets that we have across the sector as being a, a, a key problem that needs to be solved. So that they were a key uh, driver behind the activity list, and that being that. Um, and then on offers around the price, and without that, uh, it's difficult for someone to know whether it's something that's appropriate for them to go to or not. Um, and if, you know, and, and also sorting by price and, and those type of things. And so that's that's where those things came from. Uh, it, it wasn't driven from a a kind of a hypothetical user experience per se, as like you know what it. Although it does sound like some of that relates to kind of hypothetical user experience. It was more, what's the minimum? Like, if you take any of those things out, does the data still make sense? You know, if you take the location out, we just say there's yoga happening at seven o'clock. Does that make sense? Um, you know, is it is it something that's useful? And that 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 was the type of test that was was being applied. Hopefully, you can hear me a little better now. So, sorry about that. Um, that that was helpful. I think uh, you know it's. In terms of, is it the right time for, for a refresh of these things? It, it, only if it makes any you know, any sense. We, 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 we're exploring what work needs to be done on the validator to ensure they're, they're up to date um, and you know, relate those, connect those to the uh, test suite more, more in a more integrated way. And so, you know, we are, Creating some resource to, to work on on the validator. So if there are changes to these things, they could be reflected. But I think going back to the going back to the, the use case discovery, we, we know these are minimum system fields to allow a basic search query um, over the data. That might not be a particularly good experience, as uh, as Stephen says. There, that is, is that minimum version really worth it? Um, so when we come to talking about data quality, we, we, we want to go beyond just ticking the boxes to get through the validator. So, you know, what, what do we want to know? Um, I suppose we need, it's things like start dates, um, and times are valid. They're not, you know, 10 years in the future or in the past, um, do the kind of things that we can start to measure on a, on a more regular basis. Is there anything um, like that that comes out? I think, and we mentioned the activity list. I think I do think that's an important um, data asset that we can we can potentially do more with in the in the initiative. Uh, so right now, the, the the kind of mandatory things on there are the the title and the concept. Are you linking it back to the activity list vocabulary? Um, so, but I think Chris, in your exploration, you found that there's, there's some variations there or that some inconsistencies. So, yeah, I mean, I've had a, a look through some data, um, just as you know, to see if there's any evidence of any particular, I don't know, regular repeated data quality issues. You know, I mean, you can. Like with most things, you know, we know data is never going to be 100%, but obviously we want to try and get as close as we can to it. But, you know, I can see there are some issues around, you know, completeness within the data, you know, some fields that are missing that apparently are required. So I'm not sure, obviously, how um, they've managed to get through, but I, I'm not too sure on the data that I've looked at if it's quite old and it has been fixed since then. But, I mean, this goes back to... I don't know if anyone's, you know, when you go through the testing phase, everything obviously goes through and it's all fine and, and signed off. Obviously, I'm not too sure how the process all works. Nick, I'm thinking back to previous roles I've been in. But then when you get through to, you know, when they go live and they start passing live data through, 
you know, surely, obviously, that those required fields should then still come through. So it, I'd noticed that, you know, some required fields were missing. Um, just a bit of um, inconsistency around um, some providers, you know, provide, you know, completing fields that others aren't now. It's not around, you know, the required fields, but around recommended. Do we want everyone to really try, you know, to get that data quality as high as we can? Do we want people, uh, you know, sorry, um, the data to be exactly the same across um, the, uh, you know, so that we can measure those metrics, you know, more efficiently? A um, bit of, um, you know, inaccuracy as well around, um, well, this is, I mean, what I found in, in some sessions, some sessions names were saying gym session, 50 minutes. This was in the name but then when you looked at the time the duration it said one hour now the, we've obviously got some inconsistency there so you know it's picking up on those little things there making sure that okay if you're going to put a time in the name make sure it tallies up obviously to the duration so those are just a few things that kind of stood out but is that things that we should be measuring is that you know um is this a concern? Is this an issue that people have seen in their data? Um, and obviously, I, I don't know. This is just what I've sort of found. Uh, I need to obviously have conversations with uh, the community. I think even you off mute can uh, say something or. Yeah, yeah, Chris, just pick up on that comment there. It's, it's interesting one to call out. Yeah, it's an interesting one to call out, actually, that, that specific example, because um, a, a lot of the operators will, will schedule activities that are less than the hour, but they'll actually program them to be. To take up an hour on the system. Oh, okay. So therefore, you, you so you'll, sh you'll schedule a class to take place at the start of one o'clock, and the end time on the system will be two o'clock. But actually, the advertise is being only fifty minutes because you know it, it might take place over lunchtime. You want to give people ten minutes to get out and get back to work uh, on the hour. You know, so so from a practical application, that example isn't isn't um, is a good one to call out as as the way the operators us use the system and I would practically put that in place in order to attract customers in to do activities. But then you get this disparency that you've just called out, which I recognize, but nevertheless, it's, we've got reasons for doing it. Now, I yeah. think that's it, it, ticking off some of those kind of little queries, you know, that, that that's not a, is it a data quality issue? It's a way of uh, ensuring people have got time to get in and out. You know, it's an hour slot effectively, but those, those are, you know, good, Good to kind of build our picture of of the practices behind the data. I think that's the uh, you know, and and that's how that's the whole purpose of this uh, exercise. And, and also, 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 just also worth worth calling out for everybody's benefit here is that, is that you know we're we're the ones who deal with the customers. We're the ones who deal with the customers that turn up. So if you start an activity five minutes late for whatever reason because the microphone's <laughs> not working, uh, and then you finish it five minutes early, then the customers only had fifty minutes out of an hour slot. So therefore, if you only advertise it's 50 minutes and the customers can't complain. And again, that's a reality because that's what actually happens. You know, so from an operator's perspective, that's another reason why we did. We don't do it for all classes, but some classes we do. Two other things I just want to pick up on. What program? Has anyone can anyone give an example of, of how a program fits? This is more of an aspirational. Uh, field, I think it's fair to say, program. Uh, there's some work that's been done to take the Les Mills classes, for example. Um, uh, this was in discussions with Les Mills ages ago um, to um, populate a, a directory of those classes uh, with the relevant uh, images and videos and all the, the content that Les Mills provides to anyone that's using the, those classes. Um, as, as, and has licensed them within their center. Um, and the, the program allows for the, um, the Les, so it, it's, it's allows, it allows the reverse lookup experience. So if you're Les Mills and you wanna see all of your programs across all the different centers where they appear, you can describe, people can link to that and say, this is a Les Mills program. And then, uh, then you can, either find all the Les Mills programs in the same way as you can with the activity list, kind of find yoga in general, or um, the other way around. Um, you can um, see what this program is with the full content available from the, from, from for example, Les Mills. Um, and for those that aren't aware, Les Mills provides kind of uh, classes with their own branding, very specific videos and, and, and 
everything around it. So it's not just a, uh, a hip class, for example, um, but it would be a very, it'd be body pump or something, which is their specific mm -hmm. brand of, of hip. Does, um, and for people who aren't Les Mills, what, what use does program get? Does, does it still? So if, if for people that aren't, well, it's the Les Mills, that's the use case. It's the Les Mills type of organizations that have um, licensed programs. England Netball is another one. Um, they have, you know, some NGBs have licensed programs that they run. Um, I, I think, um, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of what the No Strings Badminton. I think No Strings Badminton is an example where in the NGB of Badminton runs a No Strings session, which anyone can run, uh, but they they have the kind of content around it. And so that that is a required field field to get to the validator. Um, so no, no, it's it's not it's it's not about it's not a required field. The the program is optional. So, I see. But if you do have a, if you do have a program, you have to have the URL and the name, etc. I get, I get it now. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so it's, it's worth saying that the, the 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 things that are described within the object are the minimum to make the object useful. So exactly, if you have a program, you need to at least describe it with the name, otherwise it's not useful. Um, likewise with any of the other um, objects. But but yeah, as you rightly say, if you don't have a program, you don't have to include it at all. I'm with you. Um, and latitude and longitude on um, location, postal address, everyone agree that it would be required? So that's a, the, this is an interesting one because there's no open Git. There's an open GitHub issue relating to this. Um, the, the latitude and longitude only being required um, if an address is not specified. Um, that's the that's the open GitHub issue. We can. I mean, there's been talk, discussions in previous calls around that specific issue and why that might be useful. Um, but but currently, it is I'd say this particular area is is a little bit aggressive in terms of what it asks for. But all the fields of the address to be present, which I think people have found might be difficult to include, especially I think all four fields, including county or whatever it is. Um, yeah. So that that's an area that we could we, that that is in that issue. There's a discussion about loosening that for that for that reason. Count is no longer a kind of required field in in, in addresses. I haven't done it for some time. I think. Um, Okay, so I, I think we want to kind of tackle the kind of second question um, in the last few minutes, which is around um, what kind of um, measures we might we might look to to ex to expect or to to look for on some of these fields. So if I can just get rid of the shrink that one, um, so. Activity is mandatory, I believe. Uh, looking again at that, yeah. Activity is mandatory, and in in that, it means it must have a, um, a title, preferred label, from the from the vocabulary thing. Is there any kind of measures beyond that kind of existence of the data that we want to to look at? So, for example, the activity list should be in the activity. The activity name should be an activity list. It's but I think we do get some coming through that are that are not in the list. Is that I think uh, I've seen that in the data. Um, so that, that one maybe. kind of the names of the activities are consistent with the activity list. Is that a reasonable measure? Or are people aware of there's a lot of variation in the names and uh, the activity list isn't up to date enough or for example okay. uh, the the requirement around the activity list is that it, it currently the validator validates that you've got to use the 
uh, something from the activity list if you're publishing data that is um, reporting to be referencing the activity list. So that's that check. If you're using activity list, you should use the activity list. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, that means that those two things should match. Generally speaking, I think everyone who uses the activity list at the moment, um, at least I'm aware of, is using it. Um, there's a recommendation to update it every night on a nightly basis so that you can make sure the latest activities from that are agreed by that committee are included. Um, so, yeah, um, and the validator currently validates for those things. So I don't know if you've seen the, the rules page within the validator that might be worth looking at. Um, the rules page in the validator shows you all the rules that the validator currently runs against every um, every feed that it validates. And the, that the activity, that um, is it complete, is it consistent, is it valid? Yeah, that stuff's all in there at the moment as a rule, or as a series of rules um, that the validator checks. Um, and as I said, generally is, is met. There is a situation where the pref label, um, it's possible to specify activities, well, it, it was possible in a, in a previous um, uh, version of this to specify activities that are just made up and not related to the activity list. Um, so that's what you might be saying is in some of the feeds, um, but the newer ones certainly uh, match match that, or they'd fail the validator as it stands. Well, I think well, the, um, you know, the range, there are a range of feeds of out there out there at the moment. Some of them were developed over time. Some of them won't meet the latest um, version. So um, that does feel like a, a measure then. It, it's, it's, if it was possible to put out some open active data under the heading, if not you know, meeting the, the latest, very latest of the spec, uh, then that's something we can, we can validate and explore. Um, I, I mean, I, this this might be a very specific suggestion, but uh, to draw on what the previous conversations we've had on this um, in this forum around data quality. Uh, so you've got this required concept and you've got the rules and the validator that exist to make sure the things that are required are required and things that claim that they're happening are happening and all that kind of thing. Separate to that, you've got this idea, as we talked about earlier, which is the let's call it a profile, a profile of the of the fields that are needed for a particular use case. Um, and I think this is actually work that's been codified in some form in, in previous um, work, what the ODI has, the ODI has actually undertaken, never completed, just the, started this work. And so, and the idea of the data profiles was that if you have um, a data profile, for example, for the discovery use case, let's say, that that might include a number of fields that you could then measure whether they you know, whether the data is fit for discovery, let's say, or fit for booking or fit for, you know, X. And effectively what you've got is your list of required is is more than the validator is, is asking at a bare minimum. Um, and, though, and, and, and having that list, so for discovery, we need this list of things. Um, you can then do what this slide is showing. You can have a measure of how much of that is being delivered by the, the data publisher. So you can say, you know, the data discovery use case requires these 20 fields um, to be discussed, right? If there's, an, if there's an open active standard data discovery use case that people can point at and say, we want all of that. As a client, for example, of, of, of GLL, they might say, we want all of that. And then GLL have to say, well, we can't, we haven't got this or this or this or this. Um, so it, the point of the data discovery um, uh, sorry, the point of the profiles is not to for Open Active to mandate anything over what the clients may ask for, specifically from a central centralized perspective. But it's more because there's so many there's such variety in all the different bits. But it's more to say there's something we've got which is a kind of agreed on and we've named it. So a client without really understanding anything else can just say, "I want that one," and then ask for it. And then anyone that's implementing has to, you know, say how much of it they can provide, which is kind of what we did with MCR and with others um, in terms of, you know, they've come up with a profile, a list of things that they've asked for. And then um, other people who are implementing against what MCR have asked for have gone, yeah, we can do that. We can't do this. We can do that. We can't do this. Um, and so it, rather than representing this as required in the spec, if we represent it as a profile and then we, what's on the slide, measure against it, then 
that might be a way of of kind of achieving this. Um, that that think, does, that, yeah, is within the I think that's sense. really helpful. That's really helpful. And I think um, between what you just said and Stephen's earlier comment that 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 minimum, those green things, it, you know, what kind of a search experience would that be? So um, I think we've got enough to go on, actually, because um, what we, and I mean, I mean, Chris, um, can do now is uh, is explore those, the green stuff's mandatory. It's in, it's got to be in the data to pass the latest version of the feed. But what we can do is come up with some exploratory measures uh, for those green and orange ones. And that's the, 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 Required and recommended. So that's going beyond that bare minimum of the system requirements uh, and start to explore how much of that is being delivered by publishers. Um, and as you say, it's not about mandating those um, extra fields. It's about understanding um, if, if these you know, and we'll, we'll just draft something up based on these orange and green fields as, uh, for discussion, uh, something to explore. Um, but if we think that that's the right profile for that enhanced or a, a good level of a minimum experience for a user in the discovery use case, um, then that's a, a start we can make, you know, we can, we can explore what that looks like. Does, does that make sense? If, if, if we come up with some draft measures around completeness or consistency or whatever it might be for some of those from the picking from the green and orange fields, and we'll present that as a, you know, a, a very simple uh, report or dashboard or something, and just see if that kind of adds any uh, insight in conversation or, or value to, to publishers um, or, or data users. And that's a good. Um, I, think, I, think, I think I think I think it's a I think it's a good measure and it's a good point to be made there, Howard. I think certainly from a model perspective, with regards to the fields that are being passed, whether it be mandatory, whether it be optional, and so on and so forth. I think I'm a bit hesitant with regards to if we're looking then to verify the quality of the data being passed by the operator, because it's already been highlighted through Stephen and, and everyone actually who can't be here today who I represent, but. They're obviously in control of their own data because it's not just used for this um, this platform. It's also used for their own internal applications as well, as sort of Stevens highlighted as well. They've got their own booking systems and those sort of things, kiosks inside. So it's meaningful to the end user. So I'd, I'd be a bit wary that that this starts looking at the quality of the data being passed. I think that's down to the operator themselves in their quality of the data. Good to highlight, but I think to validate in the quality of what's expected and being passed in the model and the schemas, I think that's a good start to be. Uh, that's exactly, I, I, I'd second that comment, absolutely, um, from Andy there. The, the validator should be validating the system level stuff and the data quality framework, if there is one applied, as we just, as I, I, I recommended a minute ago, that's something that is applied to the data after the, the implementation is complete. So it's not a, um, it's not, it's not that the, the the operator is, it's not like the system is unable to validate anything at all, um, if they are, if they're not hitting one of those criteria. Um, so and and it's said that totally different things. So when the system is building the stuff, they can validate against the the core fields as as we've we've talked about. And when the quality of the output data is being measured, that's when we use data quality framework or whatever it is applied to that with the fields in the profile uh separately oh, and, to, and, and, and oh, i was going to say build, building on that uh the in terms of that starter for 10 for the discovery profile i'd actually suggest that we 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 share um if you haven't already got access to it you might um already but the there's a, that profile that emerged from from various places as i meant as i mentioned that spreadsheet that we've been using um, it might just be worth using that as a basis because that's something that's gone through iteration across uh, MCR, the different booking systems. Um, and you can kind of start with that and say, and this is the stuff that GLL, for example, recently implemented um, and uh, and all the pilots and the, the booking pilots that just went through um, aimed for as well um, as a starting point. 
so it, it, is, it is comprehensive and it might be that we decide to, to remove some things from it um, but it might be worth starting from that rather than kind of you know a, a bottom up excellent, excellent. If, you, if you can take that out i think that would be really helpful thank you very much um so we're, we're just about at time i um i forgot to do the, the register earlier on so I'll, if i could just do that we've got Stephen from gll myself uh chris and tim from the odi ollie from london sport Andy Gordon from Gladstone, Nick Evans from Iron, and Nish from Iron also. And we did have Tom Paxton earlier, I believe, also. Um, so thank you very much, everyone.